Glad to see Jackie Robinson play. It was a, an incredible baseball game for a young youngster who wanted to someday play the game, you know, beat somebody. We knew what, what was going on with Jackie Robinson uh, to an extent. We knew the race problem. I remember a teacher told us that uh, the only reason the Dodgers were having spring training is because Jackie Robinson, you know, they, they want to keep him away from the problems in the South. But we heard the stories, but to, to us, that was, they really didn't have any relevance because, hey, I wasn't going to go play baseball in Florida or anywhere else. Dictator Rafael Trujillo had invited the Dodgers to the island in 1948. Though not a fan of the game, Trujillo realized he could use baseball to make his regime more popular. A big crowd and a familiar cast in the dugout are here as President Trujillo of the Dominican Republic throws out the ball. It wasn't the first time that Trujillo used baseball as propaganda. But while the dictator only cared for baseball as a form of propaganda, his son, Ramfis, was a dedicated fanatico. The Air Force Baseball Club, Aviación, became the Playboy's personal fantasy league team. With the power to draft any young Dominican into the armed forces, Ramfis was able to force the best Dominican players to join the Air Force and play baseball. Next morning, you know, I, I hear that knock in my, in my door about 8 o'clock in the morning. I opened the door and I saw a, a lieutenant dressed, you know, from military outfit. And uh, he handed me that, a telegram. So when I, when I read it, it said, report it right away to the Dominican Air Force. Signed, Rafael Trujillo, hijo. That means Rafis. I left to go to Laguna Verde to see my mother and show her the, the telegram. He used to come watch the game. He used to come right behind no play. We went back to Manzanillo and played for, play a doubleheader. And you know we lost both games. Rafi didn't believe in that. So he got every player to spend five days in jail and the manager got 30 days and Biruta Pichardo got five days. <laughs> On September 26, 1956, after Felipe finished his first year in the minor leagues, Ose Virgil became the first Dominican to play in the major leagues. Being a rookie, I remember very clear, uh, my first at bat, it made me proud uh, to be in the first Dominican to play in the major leagues. In San Francisco, the big city is big league for the first time. Market Street bids the San Francisco Giants welcome as they open the season in their new home. 1958 is the, the year when the Giants moved from New York to California. I had a pretty good idea that I was going to make that club sooner or later. On the 6th of June of that year, I made the club. And the next day I played my first game. It was so memorable. I got three, three hits and four at-bats. My first year, I lived in uh, Daly City with Orlando Cepeda and Ruben Gomez, my first year. Then the second year, I lived in, in North Beach with the hippies. I, I didn't even know where I was moving. I went to living with the hippies there. Who's the best player of the Dominican Republic? Complete player. I would say Felipe Lou. Back in the Dominican Republic, Horacio Martinez was busy signing the next wave of Dominican Giants. In, in July 1960, Juan Marichal made what might have been the greatest pitching debut in the history of Major League Baseball. Uh, my first game in the Major League was the 19th of July, 1960. It was a night game. I remember exactly uh, what was going around the bench on that after the fifth inning when they they keep looking at the uh, at the scoreboard and, 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 and watching inning by innings that I was I was pitching a no hitter. 
Nobody was saying anything. Nobody was, was talking on, on the bench. They knew, you know, that I, I was pitching a no-hitter, and I, I, I knew it too. Eighth inning, Clay Darimpo came to the plate, and uh, as a pitch hitter, and Tom Sheehan came up to the mound. Orlando translated to me, and uh, he said, well, Tom Sheehan don't want you to throw this guy a fastball. I said, okay, let's, let's go with the breaking ball then. And uh, the first pitch I threw was a breaking ball, and I hit a, uh, a single to center field. You don't see the ball, you see his leg, now you see his arm come over, now you see the ball. Mary Shaw, I uh, call it a doctor of pitching. As the 1960s began, the Dominican Giants' dominance on the field was at its height. By contrast, the Dominican dictator Trujillo's hold on his nation was beginning to slip. It was a regime of torture and, and death, and you had to keep your mouth shut. I believe the United States had at that time, I lost friends and some relative to, to the terror of the dictatorship. Assassin's bullet put a bloody end to the 31 year dictatorship of Dominican strongman Rafael Trujillo. He was killed in May 61, and the, the people that love uh, freedom and, and liberty and democracy, that we were relieved. Power. When something like that happens, you really don't know who's going to kill you, which side is going to, to, to shoot you. We were trying to play the Winter League during the general strike. And uh, we were stuck, the Escogido Club was stuck in Santiago for one week. That we could come home with the same clothes. And then they, the league was over, they, they canceled the season. I left Dominican Republic for spring training. I left my fiance here in Dominican. And uh, I can't concentrate. I was thinking about her all the time and thinking about the situation in, in, in my country. Some of my friends of today, they tell me that they woke up one day and they were, there was an aircraft carrier there and there were some airplanes making some flights over and, and all of a sudden there was some landing. I had to say that I resented the fact that troops from other countries are telling me which way to go and which way to turn. I was very scared about my family, about my friends, because it was, uh, was uh, uh, killing people in the street, you know, right and left. When the season started, I was at the top of my game and confidence-wise at the top of my career. The Giants uh, had an, an uh, all-star team, five players. Willie Mays, Orlando Cepeda, Felipe Lou, Jim Davenport, and myself. At DC Stadium in Washington, here's that rare game that draws all the superstars together at one time, including sports-minded President Kennedy, looking as eager as the most avid fan. October 1962, and it's the second playoff series in the last four years for the National League. 1962, we ended up tied with the Dodgers, so we had to go to a, a, a two out of three playoff. Now I'm pitching the third game. We lost in four to two. Hit four to two, but the Giants counted out so often during the season, bounce back again. 
They have a rally rolling in the ninth. They have all the pitchers ready on that team to save that two runs. For some reason, uh, they left Stan Williams pitch to Orlando Cepeda and Willie McCovey. Orlando Cepeda greets him with a fly to right field. A very unintentional walk forces Philippe Ballou across and the Giants lead. We score four runs on that, on that inning. We end up winning the, the champion. And now it's on to San Francisco and the World Series with the New York Yankees. We made uh, going back to San Francisco. We can't bring the airplane to the gate because it was a mob. <laughs> I think the whole San Francisco city was uh, at the airport. The day after winning the National League pennant, the Giants returned to San Francisco to begin the 1962 World Series against the New York Yankees. After defeating the Dodgers in a three-game playoff, right at Dodgers Stadium, we had to play the next day a day game against the Yankees at Candlestick Park. It was, we were really tired. Playing against the Yankees, you know, everybody wanted to play either for the Yankees or against the Yankees, especially in that World Series. Mickey Mantle and Elston Howard of the Yankees seem confident. And so does Philippe Ballou of the Giants as he warms up. The Dominicans excel throughout the series, with Felipe and Mati Alou making brilliant catches in the outfield. But by game three, the Giants found themselves down two games to one, with Juan taking the mound for game four. Juan Marichal, high-kicking right-hander, will start for San Francisco. Whitey Ford, winner of the opener, will go for the Yankees. I get to pitch the fourth game in New York. I think I was pitching the best, the best game of my life. I strike out Mickey Mantle twice, and we were winning two nothing, going to the fifth inning. I was hitting, so Alvin Dark told the coach to give me the suicide squeeze sign. Tom Holly was coming from third, so I have to try to bunt that ball. And by trying, it was a ball four. The ball was going to hit my ankle. And I went down just to get that ball and put the bat on the ball. And instead of putting the bat, I put my finger, my index finger, and the whole nail came off. And that was the end of 1962 for myself. We ended up winning that game. Chuck Hiller hit a grand slam. A long drive deep to right field. Maris can't reach this one. It's gone. Davenport scores. Matty Alou scores. The Yankees won game five, and the series returned to San Francisco. But rain delayed play for three days. When the series resumed in soggy Candlestick Park, Felipe and Orlando rallied the Giants. Orlando Cepeda hammers the ball into deep right center. Mandel and Maris race for it. It's in between them for extra bases. And the Giants win 5-2. The series is tied at three victories each. And now the title rides on the final game. It's D-Day at Candlestick. Six months of baseball now spirals to a climax in just one game. The tense struggle moves into the Yankee fifth without a serious scoring threat on either side. And that brings Tony Kubek to the plate with the bases loaded, nobody out. Kubek hits sharply to Pagan and it's on to first for a double play, but Skyron scores to give the Yankees a one to nothing lead. When they score that run, I'll I, I never forget telling Orlando Cepeda, I said, Orlando, you know, that run is going to be very difficult to overcome because the wind was blowing. It was like a gale blowing straight in from center field. Matty Alou leads off for the Giants in the ninth. Beats out a drag bunt. With the score one to nothing, he represents the tying run. I made a perfect bunt. I make to first. and uh, So I say, well, I did my job. Matty Alou get on base. They tried to bunt Philippe Alou. I was asked to bunt, and I, the ball, I, I, I had to believe that the, the wind really blew that bunt foul. 
It was such, such a strong wind blowing. After one bunt attempt, Philippe Ballou swings away. Boyer is relieved that he missed. Alvin Dart let me swing the bat because Clay Boyer was almost underneath my bat, and I foul off the pitch. The third pitch, they threw a fastball up and in, and I struck out swinging. I, I really felt bad about it. Ralph Terry also strikes out Chuck Hiller. Now Elston Howard goes out to talk to Terry while the menacing Mays steps into the box. Willie Mays came up to bat with Matty in first. He hit a ball to right field. Mays hammers the ball down the right field line. Maris with expert feeling. When the ball hit the ground and stopped there and give uh, Roger Maris the, the opportunity to come and grab the ball, throw it to Bobby Richardson, and Richardson threw it to home play. It was a well executed replay. He threw the ball high speed, one, one hop to the catcher. And Mary Lou was being held at their base. He would have been out, no question about it. A lot of people say, oh, no, Marty could have, could have scored. There was no way. The relay stops him. He has to go back to third while Mays continues to second with a double. And thus the tying and winning runs are in scoring position. Manager Howe talks to Ralph Terry, a tense situation where a base hit could change the picture. Willie McCovey was the next batter. Everybody thought they was going to walk McCovey because uh, was Orlando was next and was a right-handed pitcher on the mound. He took the chance like a good gambler. Almost does. Willie McCovey hits a tremendous curving drive to right. But it's a foul ball, and the fans groan. McCovey slashes away again. A sizzling line drive. I never, I never saw a ball hit so hard in my life. Hit uh, one of the hardest ball I've ever seen in Riot Richardson who, by the way, were playing shallow right field, playing second base at shallow right field. And that was the end of it. The Yankees win one to nothing on a brilliant clutch effort by Ralph Terry, the hero of the 20th World Championship won by the New York Yankees. Could have won either way, because if that ball was a little bit higher, I think he'd end up in the ocean. <laughs> Could not believe we lost it, especially with a land drive like that. Well, imagine the seguidores de los gigantes aparte y como dominicanos al fin se sintieron mal, ¿tú me entiendes? When you played seven games, seven good games like we did in 1962, uh, you say, well, the best team won, and uh, we have to give them credit to the Yankees. Though the Dominican Giants have become one of baseball's best teams ever, they never returned to the World Series. And just one year later, at the end of the 1963 season, the Latin core of the Giants was torn apart. Back in the Dominican Republic, political turmoil continued to haunt the players. The Winter League season was cancelled. Still, the Dominican government, realizing how baseball could lift the spirits of Dominicans, organized a three-game goodwill exhibition against Cuban players. When Major League Commissioner Ford Frick learned of the series, he forbid Dominican and Cuban major leaguers from taking part. They played anyway, and Frick fined them. The fine so outraged Felipe that he wrote an article for Sport magazine recounting his experiences in baseball from racism in the Deep South to the Fort Freak incident. I was free-minded. I'm, st I'm still that way. You can't change. And I, uh, I said some things that the Giants didn't like. Uh, the commissioner of baseball didn't like. I didn't understand the power of the establishment at that particular time. He speak freely about what he think. And I believe that's one of the reasons why they got a great deal of respect for Felipe because he did not hold back anything. Uh, everybody had to respect Felipe Lou. He was uh, the, 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 the leader of most of the Latin players. I played for Alvin two years, and by the time the second year was over, I knew I was going to be traded. Uh, there was something that they didn't like that I said. There was no shouting, there was no argument, but it didn't go very well. The first meeting that they had in the winter of 1963, I was gone to, to the Milwaukee Braves. To me, until these days, 
I don't know why. Because Felipe was one of the premier baseball player in National League. It shocked me and it really hurt me. I missed the city. I missed uh, Cepeda and Juan Marichal and my brothers. It, it was very difficult. Uh, sometimes you you make mistake, you know, and I think that was one of the biggest mistake that, uh, mistake that the Giants ever make. It was the beginning of the end of the Dominican and Latin Giants. Following Felipe's trade, Jose Pagan, Mati Alou, and Orlando Cepeda, the baby bull, would all be traded away. As the Dominicans moved from team to team, they continued to excel, representing themselves and their country in all-star games and the World Series. Mati Alou won the batting championship and Manny Mota set baseball's all-time pinch hit record, while Juan Marichal became the winningest pitcher of the 1960s. Despite his infamous fight with Joan Roseboro, he became the most admired Dominican star of the decade. During his career, he won 242 times and completed 241 games. In the 1970s, Juan, Manny and the Alos retired to become coaches and scouts. A new generation of Dominicans took to the field. By the 1990s, they had made the Ryland Nation the Republic of Baseball, the best source of talent in the game today. Then, in 2003, Felipe's career would come full circle. Please welcome Ray Dora. Number 25, Barry Bonds. Ladies and gentlemen, today he becomes the only man in the history of the San Francisco Giants to be here for an opener in uniform at Seal Stadium, Candlestick Park, and Pacific Bell Park, back with the Giants where he started since 40 years ago. Ladies and gentlemen, the manager of the Giants, number 23, Felipe Alou. I believe I have represented my country well, representing the Dominican baseball player. And not only that, representing baseball in general. Because when we put on a uniform, we are representing the game. And I feel, I always felt that way. Now joining Felipe on the pitcher's mound, please welcome Matty and Jesus Salou to throw out today's ceremonial first pitches. I know there's still some time to go. I have some time left with the Giants, and I pray God that nothing happened that, that, that would destroy what we believe we have built up over the course of a lifetime. But, I, but I'm proud of representing the Dominican Republic. In May 2005, the San Francisco Giants dedicated a statue of Juan Marichal. Felipe thanked his compadre Juan and said the statue represented all Dominican players and all Dominicans. That same day, Dominicans could be found playing throughout the majors. By opening day 2006, over 400 Dominicans have played Major League Baseball. By the time you're watching this, there will have been more. And Felipe, Manny, Juan, Osi, Mati, and Jesus personally coached or recruited many of them and served as heroes to them all. Consider 